What's up guys? This is The Organic Guy, your host of The Organic Guy podcast and welcome to episode 17. All right, this particular episode is proudly sponsored by Think Organic Kenya, who proud themselves as being the home of organic products. So Think Organic Kenya is an e-commerce with a mission to ensure that you have access to a wide variety of organic products affordably and conveniently so the amount of variety of organic products that you can be able to find is like no other in the country so you can shop anything from fresh organic products to beauty products to organic superfoods so the variety of organic products available is wide at very affordable prices and of course delivered to you conveniently at the comfort of your couch so make sure you check them out that is at thinkorganic.co.ke and you can use the coupon the organic guy to get a 10 percent off so use the coupon code the organic guy to get 10 percent off once you do your shopping all right so make sure you check them out all right in this particular uh podcast i had the pleasure of hosting uh the one and only miss sylvia courier who is an organic farmer and an organic entrepreneur of course among other things she's mom wife but she's very very big in organic so had the pleasure she had um she was really really humble with her time so we discussed a lot of things from her um early childhood um her love for organic how she became really really a big lover of organic and what it stands for her journey on uh, how she's been organic farmer some of the challenges that she's had some of the successes that she's had so it's a conversation that you definitely don't want to miss so without further ado ladies and gentlemen talking too much this is how the conversation really went down so cheers Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. It's been um, a learning experience because um, we've done this, you know, with different farmers, and um, we've seen why they do what they do. And um, I must appreciate that we've learned a lot of things when we were in the field. Yes. So um, just before we talk more about um, what you do, it's, it's fair, I guess, you give people an overview mm-hmm. of um, who you are and. Uh, what you do. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm actually a city girl. Mm. I was actually born and raised in Nairobi city. Okay. But then what used to happen was uh, like during the holidays, we are always at my grandma's place. Yeah. That's where I started with my love for agriculture. Okay. And I remember being very young, seven, eight years old, going with a jembe and digging mm. and learning how things grow. Yeah. So fast forward to when I got to campus. Mm. I wasn't able to get to uh, study about agriculture, mm. but I did more about social work. Yeah. But at the back of my mind, I always knew one day, given a chance to have some soil, I would plant something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, many years later, we got a chance to move to Limuru yeah. as a family. So we came and settled here, and mm. we are in Deya, which is the semi-arid dry part of Limuru because yeah, yeah, Limuru has a cooler place mm. in Tigoni and Gesha yeah. it's cooler on the other side but here it's semi-arid and uh, we said you know what let's just try it out mm. you know because um, it being dry many people yeah. had told us that it may not be able to work okay. but we said let's give it a go mm. and then uh, being a very warm and dry area what happened was when I started farming we had a lot of pests and diseases mm. that were affecting us and the usual thing as most farmers would do, mm. you take a sample and take it to the agrovet yeah. and you're given a solution for it. Exactly. And you're told you need to spray it 
and then the pest or whatever problem you have should go in a few days. Yeah, and it happened, but you know, I was not comfortable because mm. I kept wondering how does this thing work this fast. Yeah. And then when I did a bit more research, I realized that many of the um, pesticides mm. and fungicides that are uh, like not natural, mm. they are you know not very good for you yeah and even if they give this i don't know what they call the level where they say you know that the food is safe after a particular time of spring oh, yeah. you know i don't know if it's the phi post harvest interval yeah, yeah? the post harvest interval yeah. you know they would say it's four days and i would like you know there's no way something that i put on a mask to spray mm -hmm. after four days will be safe okay. for consumption mm -hmm. so i learned that there's actually an alternative which yeah. is organic agriculture yeah so I did a lot of reading and research and also went out to visit organic farms to learn how it's done. Yeah. So I moved from being a conventional farmer to organic in a very short period of time. I think mm -hmm. I only did the conventional farming for about a year yeah. and I thought it's not working. And I started as a small garden. So I had a little kitchen garden okay. and I thought that would be the best way for me to learn. Because mm -hmm. being a city girl, I, didn't, I wasn't able to identify many crops on the farm yeah like i would confuse carrots for dania beans for weeds i didn't know <laughs> i thought managos were beans <laughs> wow, okay. i was very green yeah. i just had the fashion but i didn't know yeah. you know how to you know how to do it yeah. and i remember even one funny thing when the lady was helping me dig yeah. i never knew whether you should dig going forwards or backwards <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, I did it as a child, but you know, as an adult, yeah, so many yeah. years pass and yeah. So I just learned from okay. scratch, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I realized that my little garden, maybe it was about three, three by three meters mm -hmm. square, yeah. was able to feed us all the greens we needed all year round with onions, yeah. you know, just your daily greens and a few tomatoes here and there, you know. And mm. I realized actually with a small space, you can actually grow a lot of food. Yeah. So I was very proud of myself because I was self-sustainable. Mm. And I was able now to use the bigger field, which was only half an acre, yeah. to grow my grains. Yeah. So my maize and beans, my peas would grow out there mm. and the daily greens would be next to the house. So I got interest from friends who wanted um, to have our vegetables. Yeah. That's when I started the basket scheme. So I would put the vegetables together yeah. and then I would go and sell it to my friends in the city. Okay. And then that's how the business has grown. And then now we have this farm here in Delia. Wow. Yeah. So, that's an amazing story because um, um, there's some, a thing or two um, bits that I can pick from the story. Yeah. Sort of kind of similar to mine. Yeah. Uh, I was also raised with um, my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So I learned a thing or two from them in terms of farming and what they were doing. Uh, later on, um, I was actually then redirected to organic farming specifically. I did it when I was young, but I didn't really know yeah. uh, what it was all about. Exactly. Yeah, because I could see they wouldn't spray or such a kind of things. But now, um, it's it's also interesting you talked about self-taught. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that you learned yourself. So it's also something that I've been also been doing um, over this period of time. Mm -hmm. And something very interesting, you're saying that you are green when you're starting. Yeah. And at this level where you are right now, you know, you have amazing, amazing amount of knowledge in terms of what to do, uh, what to grow. You have an understanding of how nature works. Mm -hmm. um, some, something that I don't see with um, my conventional friends in terms of farming. Yeah. So for you, how, how did it come now you settled on organic specifically? Is it something you thought or is it something that came to your mind uh, once? Mm. Or is it something that was there for quite a long time? How, how, did, how did it exactly come from when you decided to mention to organic farming? Okay, one uh, was the safety for my health yeah. and the health of my family. So I thought I wanted um, to know what they are eating because mm. my children were very young. Yeah. So that's when they are eating their fast food mm. so i thought you know i really need to know what they're eating and it has to be safe yeah so that was my first conviction mm. that i want to feed my family the very best and then beyond that mm. was that when i was selling the vegetables yeah. you know my conviction even from my faith is that you know you need to um or rather i thought that you know 
I need to be able to give people the very best and the safest food. Mm. So people know uh, the source of their food. And that's how we've actually got clients. Mm. And through the ups and downs, you'll find even sometimes we don't have enough vegetables. But whenever we have them, our mm. clients would always buy from us because there's a trusted source yeah. of where they're getting their food from. Another reason why I did organic, or rather mm. said that I want to do organic, was because of future generations. Yes. I want my children mm. to be able to still come on farm on this land. Yeah. What you find in Kenya now, it's very common mm. that people are only leasing land for a period of five to seven years, yeah. because beyond that, the produce will dwindle. Yeah. Because of the chemicals that have been put in over the years, makes the soil too acidic, mm. so the plants are not able to uptake the nutrients. So they have to keep moving from farm to farm. And they would always say, oh no, this farm is not good. You know, everyone wants to lease on virgin land. Yeah. And we don't have the patience to actually grow the soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for me, it's been very challenging, but I'm growing the soil for me, because mm. I'm still young. <laughs> I'll be able to enjoy <laughs> the produce of the land yeah. for a number of years, God willing. Yeah. But also my children will always be, will even find the soil in a much better state than it is today. Yeah. And grandchildren. Mm. So even as I come to the farm, I come with my children. They know how to grow organic food and they keep asking even when we go out there yeah. they're like mom is this good for us or not so they're already aware yeah and hopefully as they grow and they are taking over the work they'll be able to even teach the next generation mm. so i think for me um when you do organic agriculture it's actually the only sustainable way of farming yeah for and also if you think about the african continent mm. When we talk about food security, yeah. why is it we don't have enough food? Yeah. Why is it our soils are not producing anymore? Mm. Imagine if we have, you know, millions of farmers yeah. just saying we're going back to build our soils. We will always be food secure. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it's a good question you've raised. I mean, food security is something we've been talking for quite a while now. Uh, we've seen also the governments, you know, even dedicating time and efforts in terms of big for it's part of their big four agenda yes yeah mm. so um, something interesting you've mentioned it's um, about the challenges mm. you faced and you know the, the challenges in the organic sector can you sort of take us through those kind of challenges because I'm, I'm figuring out there are people want to come and uh, venture into organic farming yeah so for you what are some of those challenges that you encountered when you're starting organic okay I think for one is that you have to have the patience, mm. which I find is very difficult with most farmers and mm. it's extremely understandable yeah. because when you go into a particular field of business, mm. you're doing it to get a good return. Yeah. You're not doing it just for anything. Yeah. Yeah. So you find with many farmers, mm. they want to get a good return at the end of the season. So you want to plant your acre of onions or cabbages, yeah. make your money and plant another season and keep doing that mm. over and over again. So one of the things about organic agriculture is do you have the time to build your soil? When you think about how long it takes to build the soil, it will take you about three to five years mm. before you get a good soil. Yeah. Yeah. So now how many people are willing to keep composting? You know, and it's a lot of hard work because mm. now you have to get a compost pit. You have to, you know, make your compost in there. Yeah. Mix it all up. You have to have your animals and make sure your your animals are eating well like they are grass fed like mm. the ones we have here on the farm mm. they just eat all the produce of the farm yeah. so that you have a good manure then you do put that into the compost yeah. put that into the soil planting your cover crops yeah. to protect the soil that takes a long time mm. so that's the thing about uh it's that you find that many people do not want to venture into it because they're not going to get quick returns yeah, yeah. at the end of the season mm. you know but i keep telling them if you don't want to do that, fine, you'll get the quick returns for five years. How sustainable is that? Mm, yeah. See, if God gives you 80, mm. like if God gives me 80, 90 years on this earth, you know, where, and this land is mine, where will I move to after six years? What will I say <laughs> if the farm is not producing anymore? Yeah. So that was, uh, like, that's one of the challenges mm. about the waiting time yeah. for building the soil. Number two, when you talk about the pests and diseases, mm. you know, the thing about it is that it's very difficult for you to um, be able to do monocropping. Mm. We try doing the monocropping, which is what I'm talking about. Do one acre of one crop, harvest and make your money. Yeah. But what happens if you monocrop, like what happened to me, I planted cabbages on three acres. Mm. When I got thrips infestation, the thrips took everything out. Because mm. you know, I was doing it organically because I didn't want to, you know, to yeah, spray anything. Yeah, yeah. 
and the thrips took out all my cabbages. I had to sell it to um, some Maasai who are feeding the cows. Poor cows, it was the drought here. Yeah. The cows had to eat cabbage because there was no other greens mm. for them to eat. You know, so with it, it means you have to plant a variety of different vegetables. Yeah. And what happens is, sometimes you may not get good market mm. for one or the other. Or you won't be able to get large amounts of one type of yeah, uh, crop yeah. to give you a good return mm. so it means you have to be very strategic in your marketing mm. to know that if i plant these different crops i have a market for all of them that's why the basket scheme works for us because yeah. then when you're eating at home you eat a variety of different things exactly. so the basket scheme or selling to a shop you know which sells vegetables also works because mm. they want a wide variety yeah. of vegetables so that's the other thing about it, you know, when you talk about it being viable economically, it yeah. will take a little more time, yeah. but it will be. Yeah. Yeah, it will be. So, okay. Then maybe the other thing about which is a challenge mm. is sometimes you may not be able to grow everything yeah. all year round. Yeah. You have to look at the seasons. Mm. So you have to learn how to grow some things in one season, things that do well in the drier season, mm. that do well in the wet season. So it's difficult to maybe have the basket to have everything all year round. For example, if I have a customer who loves pumpkins, mm. I surely cannot give it to them in the cold <laughs> season. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So that's a bit one of the challenges you have to go through. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious here. Yeah. So when starting, because um, most of the guys even who come to me um, when talking a lot about organics, is that um, the initial cost is a bit expensive. Is that the case for you? Yeah, it is. Because you know you have to put in extra. Um, um, I think the initial cost, the cost would be high, mm. uh, in terms of infrastructure. See, yeah. for example, like if you go on a farm, we've had to put in some net. Mm. We have to put in some shade net, uh, you know, to reduce the UV and the the sun rays, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you have to put in greenhouse. And then also, um, nowadays, you know, like rain-fed agriculture is not mm. sustainable. You should be able to plant mm. all year round. So we had to put in investment in the dams and being able to get all the rain water during the rainy season and use it. Okay. You have to invest in a pump. So you can be able to pump the water but that is i think a challenge that i think covers uh, you know across the board, across the board. Yeah, with any farmer yeah. you know like for example water is an essential mm. without water you cannot do the farming you yeah. can't rely only on the rings yeah you know you have to look for alternatives mm. so that's the same with organic agriculture what i find mm. at the beginning the labor is high because mm. now okay. when you think about doing the composting you need people to do it yeah and people who are also willing to try you know, sometimes you can get someone to come and work and they're like, this doesn't work. It just looks like I'm not going to see mm. the result. You understand? Because yeah. you know, sometimes when you use it the first way, you can see the result easily. But by the time you do your green manure, dig it back in, mm. you know, you have to use a lot of labor okay. and time. Yeah. So that time factor is what makes it costlier in a way, because mm. then you don't recoup your money in the, the early years. Yeah. You recoup it in the later years. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So... One thing also I have to mention is, um, you know, your hunger for knowledge and you know wanting to know how things work. For a person who wants now to start organic farming, do you think there is a, in Kenya? Do you think there is a, a better support system for organic farmers, mm -hmm. um, or they have to be dependent on themselves and they have to want to learn themselves? Um, unfortunately, you have to do it yourself many times mm. i don't think we have um a manual mm. you know that is for kenya mm. which is something we're thinking about just writing down all our experiences over the years yeah so we don't really have that that's available that you can see here it is for a kenyan farmer mm. here is a handbook that will support you with your work <laughs> yeah. so a, a lot of it has to be visiting farms mm. so you have to visit other farmers yeah. and um it can be a bit difficult sometimes because the cost of visiting some of the farms could be high. Yeah. So you'll be thinking about a local, you know, farmer, mm. you know, a small scale local farmer yeah. who is struggling to meet their day to day demands. They will not pay 2000 shillings to visit an organic farm and learn. Yeah, so you see the knowledge is not very accessible. Mm. And then also, um, I think the other issue is we have very few organic farmers, yeah. you know, so because of that, you're not, we don't have a lot of knowledge mm. on 
what particular works, you know, like what works. And a lot of the things that we've gone through, to be honest, are experiments. <laughs> so we've yeah. been experimenting, but now what we're learning is we document what is working. Yeah. Even what is not working, we document yeah. it. So we tell you, don't go down this road. <laughs> this yeah. one works, one doesn't work. Uh -huh. So it's up to us who are coming up and young organic farmers uh -huh. to actually document these experiences for the benefit of other people who want to come up. Yeah. But to be honest, for now, you have to search for the knowledge, you have to read, you have to go uh -huh. online. You know, some of us are Google farmers in a way, you know, because what else do yeah, you do? It helps. You, if you don't get the information yeah, yeah. out, you know, so you Google, you experiment. Mm. Then me, just tick the boxes. This works, this doesn't work. Yeah. So it's a lot of experimentation and patience, yeah. which again is lacking with many farmers, mm. especially young farmers. You find some of them will not want to wait. They just want <laughs> the quick, quick. Yeah, it, it's challenge. I mean, when uh, you read in a newspaper, someone just made a million yeah. from uh, farming cabbages. So. Exactly. Wish you wait for that now. Exactly. Um, now talking about the um, benefit, you've been doing things for about seven, eight years. Yeah. What are what are some of the things that you can say you've um, gained yeah. from being an organic farmer? Okay. Um, first and foremost, I can talk about my health mm. and the health of my family. Wow. You know, I think that's where we should start. Mm. You know, so you've, you've actually noticed the difference. Yeah, with uh, my health. Huh. Yeah. I mean, the gospel should start from home. Yeah. I should just really have my testimony from home mm. before I say this is what it has done. Um, a few years ago, I had a skin condition mm. and it was really affecting me, you yeah. know. Like my skin would give me like issues and I used to have like rough patches. Yeah. It's, you know, and there was no cream. I saw dermatologists and there was no cream <laughs> that was assisting. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, so what happened, um, um, like over time, mm. after just having the vegetables you know like at home we'd have vegetables three times a day yeah so we have vegetables all the time you know we are chewing on carrot sticks cucumber sticks throughout the day lunch and dinner mm. has to have a vegetable so with time I actually realized that my skin just improved i didn't have to do anything about it wow. i've not seen a doctor for i don't know how many years huh. for my skin issue anymore so we are literally what we eat you are what you eat nice. and also maybe let me just give an example about my children hmm. they were born with lots of allergies hmm. and i just realized you know when i would cook their food with herbs and leek onion hmm. the allergy seems to have actually Go gone on. So we no longer have to take them to see doctors anymore and they used to be, you know, like using, uh, um, the, um, you know, like they were wheezing, so they used to use, you know, the, the inhalers. Yeah. And we've not used an inhaler for some time now. Wow. And they even had food allergies for protein. Mm. The allergy seems to have disappeared. I don't know what else to have said to, <laughs> to think that it could be. Mm. But just the fact that, you know, they're only eating what the farm produces. Yeah. Of course, I can't say that you eat 100% organic because my farm doesn't have everything. Yeah. But we're getting there. Mm. But, you know, even, I don't know whether you read an article that was there some time back mm. that says, you know, even if you eat organic for a week, it actually like reverses. Yeah. yeah. You so know? That, yeah. yeah, you've seen Reduce it, yeah? up to 90% of the pesticides. Exactly. The body, yeah. yeah, like in the body, they actually did a test with families. Mm. And they were checking their urine you know, like over one week. Yeah. And even the study that was done in France about the people who are having organic uh, food, mm. you know, they um, like reduce their risk of cancer, you know, as they grew older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've seen that. Mm. So there's studies out there that are proving but for me, I've actually seen, you know, it helps us. You've also. done your own times. Exactly. Yeah. Even just to see, like, even as we grow older, you know, we feel like, you know, we're still young, <laughs> inside out. It yeah. helps us to maintain a good weight. Because, you know, when you're always eating vegetable. Mm. Yeah. So, so it, I would just, be, it would be hard for guys to get how old Yeah, are. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Something else also with my children I've noticed, because yeah. they are taking a lot of vegetables. Um, you know, you know how it is when the kids open school, they mm. always come back home with flus and colds they're picking from their friends. My kids are not getting it. Wow. For some reason, <laughs> they're not getting sick. Uh, for some reason, they're not getting sick, they're not picking up the colds very easily. Uh, so it's very rare for them to actually have a cold. It actually takes some time. So wow. I think because, you know, like I was talking about, you know, like last year, mm. we had a lot of berries. Uh, we had a lot of raspberries. Mm. So we were eating them, we, were, we made a jam out of it. I know they are very high in vitamin C. Mm. And that was about December. So I just feel like all the vitamins they took in December mm. kept them until when they opened school in January <laughs> and they were okay, you know. So yeah. eating food high in vitamins, you know, mm. high in nutrients, it actually helps them not to fall sick. Wow. 
very often. Mm. So we hardly have a sick child in our house. Allergies seem to have gone. Mm. So that's one benefit for your health. Yeah, you know. this is very important. Yeah, so not just for me, but also for my clients, the people who are buying our vegetables, or yeah. anyone who's consuming organic, it's good for your health. Mm. Something else is also good for the environment. I mean, we've talked about it over and over again. Mm. Organic agriculture is the only sustainable way of farming. Mm. That's the only farming that will be able to see us through many years to come. So that's the other thing that I find about when you consume, mm. when you buy organic and eat organic, yeah. you're actually doing good for the environment because you're bringing back, you know, the ladybirds, you're bringing back frogs. Mm. Like our dam has frogs. Now it's hot, I don't know, they have disappeared. But you know, those are good signs. Mm. Our dam has frogs. Our soil has worms, mm. you know. So you bring back the ladybirds, the good beetles, you know. So yeah. every time you consume, it means you're encouraging the farmers who are doing organic agriculture to continue what they're doing mm. and which is good for the environment. When you talk about agroforestry, you bring yeah. back the trees. The trees have got, you know, like fodder for the animals. Mm. The trees have got wild fruits yeah. that are very high in vitamins for the children. So, you know, Rumba, I, I say Rumba when we were small, mm. you know, would climb up this Mzambarao tree. I don't yeah, know what yeah, it's yeah. called in English. <laughs> yeah. But the Mzambarao tree. And there were so many fruits we would eat to our fill. You know, yeah. but where do you find a Mzambarao tree anymore? It's an indigenous really, tree yeah, yeah. and people don't want to plant it anymore because it's going to fruit after 10 to 15 years. Mm. So most people don't want it and yet it's very good for the children. So when we talk about organic, it's not just your health, it's also the environment. Mm. It's also good for the environment, you know. Then you talk about fixing carbon back into the soil. Mm. Organic agriculture does that for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are so many good yeah, uses. Yeah. It keeps you fit. You've seen with our money maker <laughs> yeah, when you're watering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Avoid using diesel. Mm. Using the money maker, step on it. Yeah. Keep fit. Get your air pump. You know your your heart pumping. Mm. Even you know some some things like even uh, working on the farm mm. and making compost. You know it's very you know physical work mm. that just gives you general health. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So these are very very. Um, what can I say? Good uh, things that actually you have been able to experience by yourself. Yeah. Um, another thing that um, let's say makes other people afraid to convert it to organic is the issue of pests and uh, the diseases. Yes. <clears throat> which I've seen you doing a good job of it. Mm. Um, what would you recommend? Um, nowadays we're having a lot of biopesticides. Uh, yeah. Pesticides are produced by uh, chemical companies. Um, but as, as, as a person who is coming in, who is coming to now organic farming, would you recommend them to go straight to using those kind of um, biological pesticides or mm -hmm. just have that general knowledge of how they can control pesticides um, yeah. by themselves? Okay. Um, two things. One, when you start out, that's why I say start small. Because mm. when you start on a small kitchen garden, you'll mm. hardly have to spray anything. Because yeah. you'll be able to deal with the pests by doing companion planting. Mm. And companion planting is basically, I'll give my classic example, plant your cabbages mm. with onions in between, and the onions will repel a pest called diamond back moth, mm. the one that creates holes. You've seen a cabbage, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they have many, many holes. holes yeah. yeah. Mm. And actually we realized all the time we have that success. Either plant leek onion, spring onion with your cabbages, yeah. you'll repel the pest, you don't have to spray anything. You know, yeah. and then uh, simple things also in your planting program. Mm. Make sure you planted chilies, because chilies are very good. Mm. Just need to boil them, strain and spray. Yeah. And how the chilies work is just like an anti appetite Imagine this pest coming in the evening mm. when they want to munch on the cabbage. It is so chilly for them; <laughs> they literally just starve to death. <laughs> yeah. And when you do it that way, the natural way actually you actually create a balance because mm. what happens when you use the chemicals and the synthetic pesticide what happens with time is that the pests form a resistance mm. i'll give an example of a white fly i was talking to a scientist um who was just sharing with me the history of white flies yeah a long time ago we we had very little white flies and what happened was when they first got the first uh, spray the mm. chemical spray for the white flies it was too strong because mm. they thought the stronger it is the better it is to get rid of the white flies it worked the other way around the white flies got resistant mm. and white flies is one of the most difficult yeah. pests to get rid of especially with tomatoes and people who are planting diesel yeah. white flies is just a nightmare 
and the more you spray white flies, the mm. more it gets. Ask any farmer; it just gets worse and worse. Mm. But now, when you use the other biological way, now people have been forced to use the traps, mm. the sticky traps yeah, yeah, yeah. for the white flies. Because yeah. once the mature ones stick on it, of course they can't mm. get away anyway. Yeah. So that's one of the ways people are using. People are even using things like soap mm. and lots of water. Because when you spray on them, and the 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 wings get wet. Mm. Of course, they can't fly. They fall down and they die. Yeah. So people have been forced to go back to the natural ways <laughs> yeah. of doing it. So my recommendation is read, try, mm. do the companion planting, do crop rotation. Like how I got rid of my aphids mm. was mainly through crop rotation, because we had sections on the farm mm. where the beans were always had lots of aphids, and what I decided for a whole year, yeah. that whole section will only have onions different kinds of onions and chilies and different mm. things yeah and now i'm ready to plant beans there again yeah, yeah. after one whole year of not having because now that whole year has made sure that the beans are uh, sorry the aphids mm. all the population any who are hiding in the soil any who are survived died because they had nothing to munch on yeah so you know crop rotation companion planting using the locally available pesticides even mexican marigold mm. grows as a weed yeah you just need to crush it and spray it to get rid of uh, mostly the aphids and the thrips. Something else you do is physical removal. You know, I think sometimes we are addicted to spray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you can't don't. Over DNA. Exactly. See any pest? Spray. Yeah. And sometimes all you have to do is just take your hand and prune the part mm -hmm. that has the pest. Yeah. And then that part you go and burn it. Mm. That's another way. And but that works well when you do it very early. Mm. You cannot do physical removal when you have pests everywhere. So and then, but the I think the overarching thing is you must know your farm, you must be keen, mm. and you have to give it time. Yeah. So that's what I would advise. But when all fails, especially when you're doing it on a large scale, mm. then you can move to the biological control. Yeah. You have the metarhizums, and some of them work very well. Of course, we have well-known companies in Kenya mm. that are doing the research, and they actually have very good products. So you have to do your research to know what company is it. Are they certified? Mm you know to show that they actually work yeah and have they done trials so farmers should not be afraid <laughs> i ask personally yeah. before i use your product of course yeah. you know you i have, have to right. ask how was it made have you done trials show me the trial mm. and show me how it worked yeah. and you find sometimes like for example we've been struggling with spider mites let mm. me give a quick example and you find the uh, um like the biological control for spider mite doesn't deal with the spider mite found in Deya yeah. in our area mm. It will work with spider mites found in other parts of Kenya. Wow. But you know, it had to take me to go look for a scientist and mm. they're available. Yeah. Even if you go to Caldro, I normally knock on the door, I'm like, I want to talk to a scientist. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what is happening. Sometimes we are the ones who don't look for the information. Exactly, yeah. You know, we have I don't want to advertise anybody, but there are many scientists out there. Mm. So if you go there and ask, I want to talk to a scientist, and that's what I did. When he came to look at my spider mite, he said the one the biological control you're using will not work on this kind of spider mite mm. it will only work on a different kind of spider mite what i find is that kenyans are not out to search for knowledge mm. so there's a big gap yeah between the knowledge we have a lot of scientists even in the university and in different organizations mm. and the mm. farmer is here yeah. there's no bridge mm. to link science and the farmer so you know some of those things is what i've just come to learn through time and just search for knowledge yeah so now what i've done with my spider mites uh you know we have our own local concussion that we used with ginger and chili and oil and yeah. a little drop of liquid soap and it worked yeah but it works also when you do it very often yeah many times we want to come and spray once once a week for three weeks and the problem should be gone as in you literally want to watch the pests withering and dying yeah, before your very sports. eyes yeah. <laughs> That's it's difficult to do that. Yeah, I guess it's also one of the things people don't like about um, okay. using yeah, yeah. pesticides. Exactly. It takes too long. It takes to long. Yeah, you have to wait and you have to do it very often. Mm. And now, if you buy the biological, it's going to be very costly for you. Yeah. So a big part of organic agriculture is preventive. Mm. So if you do your crop rotation, if you do your companion planting, mm. if you find your pests early and do the physical removal, all those will reduce your cost as you go on because then you're going to reduce the incidence of pests mm. something else that will happen eventually is you'll have a natural balance like now as hot as it is mm. we hardly have any aphids we hardly have anything yeah. any pests on the farm right now as we speak yeah. and sometimes when you get aphids what i realize how they're working on our farm they're not on every crop mm. they will colonize one 
and I don't mind. I'm like, you eat that one broccoli, mm-hmm. but leave me the others. <laughs> so you'll find only one broccoli has a lot of aphids, mm-hmm. and the others have yeah. been spared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, because now, you see, now you give nature mm. a chance to work naturally. Yeah. And then now, you, uh, what happens with time now, we get ladybirds, mm. you know, and, and the ladybirds eat the aphid. Eat so, like the ladybirds are well fed, mm. don't eat too many <laughs> aphids, aphids can eat one broccoli, yeah, and, and everybody is happy. Other, uh, broccoli. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, well, one, one thing also I've noticed about your farm, you have um, both um, greenhouses, um, and you, you grow your crops in the, in the open field. Yeah. So one of the pro, you know, real concrete organic um, guys tend not to lean towards using, you know, greenhouses. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your point on that? Because uh, they they argue it's anti-organic. Yes. They're, you know, you're trying to force nature to yeah uh, produce a bit fast. Um, What's your, what's your take on that? Is it is it necessary? Is it you, something you can advise people also to do? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I'd like to know your take on that. Okay, fine. Um, first, you have to know know about the international organic standards mm. and what they state, mm. what they allow, and what they don't allow. When you take the standards mm. and which are online available to everybody, yeah, yeah. you'll find that uh, when they talk about organic agriculture, of course, you have to. Uh, you know let things grow naturally yeah. in their natural environment yeah. but you'll find sometimes it's not always uh, you know like you're not always able to do it and you know like they don't allow um um for pests i, I mean like they don't refuse you to use barriers yeah, yeah. especially because of their environment mm. so for example for you know like some places where it's extremely cold mm. and people still have to eat or it's extremely hot yeah. and you still have to be able to produce food what do you do in that situation <laughs> you can't say that yeah. it's because it's organic you cannot put some sort of barrier yeah, yeah. but i understand where you're coming from mm. because many people when they talk when they think about a greenhouse yeah. they assume you're spraying in there yeah and the greenhouse when you spray you know the problem with the greenhouse number one is when you're growing any crop in there and it gets pests in remember they cannot get out mm. they have got in but getting out is the problem yeah. Yeah, so it means your spraying program has to be very vigorous. Right, yeah. So when you spray a lot in there, it means whatever you've grown in there cannot be good for you. Mm. Even now, if you go to the market, they normally ask, "Is this greenhouse or is it outdoor?" Yeah. But then there are two sides of the coin. So there's a side whereby the pests come in, can't come out. You have to heavily spray with synthetic pesticides, so the food is very bad for you. Mm. But there's other part where you can use the greenhouse as a barrier. One, to keep away the pests, yeah, mm-hmm. and two, to control the, you know, like the environment in yeah. a way. Yeah. N- not really to control, but just want it to be too for hot. Rebel. For rebel. Yeah. yeah. So you have to, you, yeah, yeah um, um, like you want good conditions for, yes, for your crops to grow. Mm. So basically, that's how we use it. Because, you know, like in Limuru, when it's very cold in July and it's extremely frosty, mm. we need to put some some things in the plastic house because mm. that's what helps you know yeah. and we're not going to spray the only thing we have put is a, a, a barrier. physical barrier yeah. and nothing else okay. and then also when you have the net when you see on our farm mm. our lettuce under the net is doing extremely well because mm. we have just reduced the sun mm. yeah yeah and i don't think there's anything wrong with that because even as a person why do you put on clothes it's a barrier <laughs> to the sun the yeah. heat, yeah. the rain, <laughs> you know, because yeah. you want to be able to protect yourself. Yeah. So in that way, according to the standards that we have in organic, there's nothing wrong. Yeah. As long as, of course, you're not spring yeah. and you're taking care and the different things you have to do, of course, because now when you have your greenhouse or your net house, mm. you have to do different things to make sure you don't get the pests in. Mm, yeah. Number one is to get a double door so that when you get into one door, the other door is closed. Mm. Then that way, you're not be, uh, uh, like the pests won't be able to come in yeah. and then you have to have a footpath yeah. which you can disinfect the water with a simple bleach, very little bleach yeah. put in the water because now you're walking around the farm mm-hmm. and the largest carriers of pests are actually human beings so when you have something like a footpath yeah. you know, you're able to reduce pests from outside the farm to in Agroecology is really really emphasized in terms of um, organic and uh, you can see it all over your farm. I mean, you're growing um, different kind of varieties of crops in your farm, and um, 
you know you also have agroforestry so can you sort of take us through the agroforestry bit yeah um why is it important and why should um, an upcoming farmer or an organic farmer actually consider mm. having um, agroforestry in their farms okay so um what you talk about is basically for the farm to actually do well you have to mix the fruits ah, mm. sorry of course fruits vegetables and trees mm. so you have to have trees also on the farm yeah and I think our concept, many of us as Kenyans, is you only grow one type of tree for five years, chop it and make your millions. <laughs> that works and that's okay. Yeah. For the pool who are able to do it, that's okay. But I think for you to be able to build your soil mm. and have a microclimate yeah. that will be able to allow your crops to grow mm. well, yeah. you have to have trees. Yeah. And for us, our because of our area, we've had to accept the, the trees that will do well here. So we're not exporting, you know, trees that will need a lot of rain mm. and cool weather here. <laughs> yeah. So we're just trying to do the trees that do well here. So one thing we do is we have to check the environment yeah. and get trees that are um, local so to the area, yeah. indigenous trees here, yeah. number one. So you have to get trees that will do naturally well here. Mm. Number two is we are looking at trees that are going to be able to fix nitrogen mm. and help the soil and also give a shade yeah when you think about the exotic trees nothing mm. can grow underneath that tree so we have to look for a tree that's indigenous mm. will fix nitrogen will give a shade and will still allow crops to grow yeah. underneath yeah and then something else we're looking at is trees that will be able to provide fodder yeah as you can see now it's very dry you can hardly find grass yeah but you'll find our few goats here have some fodder to tick, mm. tick yeah. yeah so we just chop up the leaves and give the goods to eat and they have the protein and whatever nutrients they need from that particular tree mm. and then also trees that are um, able to you know like give you the wild fruits yeah. for the children to take and um, when you think about it most people will say but no I cannot be able to plant trees because my farm is small it's a mm. kitchen garden yeah but even in that kitchen garden you can actually grow some trees as a head yeah you know so when you think about um, the ones that are like uh, Kaliandra, mm. uh, you can think about Tithonia. Yeah. It works well to fix nitrogen. It works well as a pesticide. Yeah. When you think about Lucina, and those ones will just work as a small hedge. Mm. And yet they are very good for you. And the animals will eat from the fence. The soil is benefiting. <laughs> yeah. So we actually just think outside the box. Mm. And then also search for this knowledge. We have a lot of institutions mm, in Kenya that provide the kind of information. Exactly. Yeah. And even give seeds to farmers mm. to grow. But you know trees take time. Yeah. You have to put them in the nursery sometimes for a whole year. Yeah. Before you're able to plant them, you have to give them another four or five years before they grow. Mm. But when you do that, you have to think, you know, like we can't, you know, do work with so much greed. I'm sorry to say that word. <laughs> we have to think about the next generation. Mm. It's not just about me. It's about my great grandchildren. Yeah, true. Yeah, so I think trees are a very important part mm. in the whole ecosystem. Yeah, for your farm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know we've we've gone through the journey of um, um, you growing your crops, avoiding pests, and um, now we're at the point where you've actually grown your crops and uh, harvest them. Um, what does the market look like locally uh, for you, at least? How, how does the market look like? Um, I think the market cannot be sustained. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I think there's a lot of market. Mm. Um, many people are now conscious about their health. Mm. And if you read a lot of what's been happening in the media and what they're seeing what's happening, there's mm. been a lot of food contamination in Kenya. Yeah, true. You know, and most people are really conscious and wondering what is this I'm eating. Mm. And you know, they're wondering even when I buy vegetables and fruits out there, you know, they're really trying to soak them in vinegar mm. and washing with soap, you know, <laughs> just to reduce, yeah. you know, like the residues from the pesticides, mm. you know. So for us, the truth is we cannot be able to sustain even the little market we have. Yeah. I've only sold everything I have and I don't have enough okay. on the farm. Mm. So we need more people to actually farm organically, nice. you know. And yeah. what we are doing so far is we are starting to train our local you know farmers here mm. and we teach them how to grow their own little food mm. and then they can be able to sell their surplus yeah um the other thing i think that could be a challenge 
is that the food that you find that is organic mm. sometimes is not very accessible yeah. to many Kenyans because of cost. Mm. When you think about the cost factor, it could be higher. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is not necessarily that it's difficult to grow organic, mm. it's just the supply and demand. Mm. So yeah. the supply is high. Yeah. No, the supply is low. low yeah. yeah, but the demand is very high. Yeah. Supply is low. So that's where now the price of organic it's could a be a bit higher. Mm. You know, but if we're able to, you know, share with as many farmers as possible to go organic, then you know, it's going to balance out mm. such that the farmers will still be able to get some money yeah. out of farming and people can also be able to access this produce. But the market is there. People want organic, but mm. it's not enough. Yeah, so for those who don't know, you have actually your uh, system yeah. uh, seeing this basket. Yeah. Can you sort of take us through that uh, and uh, how it works? Okay, so basically we have an online platform, mm. so you just need to go log online. Mm. And then now uh, when you go online, you see the vegetables that are available. And then now we're able to uh, bring it to your doorstep. Yeah. But then to be honest, we're still working around the logistics. Because you find that, um, you know, to take the vegetables down Nairobi mm. is proving to be tricky. Yeah. So our long-term plan is actually to have an outlet yeah. whereby you're able to still log in out, um, online yeah. and from the shop, you're able to get your vegetables to you mm. or you can just walk in yeah. and pick them. Nice. So it's just something work in progress. Yeah. For now, we are still selling to friends and people around, mm. you know, close to us. Yeah. But we always welcome people to come to the farm also. Mm. You know, like we, we've, uh, we've also had some clients who actually just say, what do you have on the farm? They come here, they buy from the farm and go back home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, there's something we forgot to talk about, which is very important, I think. Um, it's about the issue of seeds. Yeah. Um, we've seen you have a very, very nice collection of seeds. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of variety. I mean, I'm just seeing seeds that I've never seen before yeah. of, of uh, beans. So, what 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 is your goal uh, behind that? Or what mm -hmm. are you trying to teach people about okay. about uh, seeds? Sustainability. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is my number one goal. Okay. We must be sustainable. Uh -huh. And what we do is, um, as anything else we've done as an experiment, we normally share seeds with farmers mm. or with friends or even buy seeds from the shop. Yeah. I come back home and I try. If the seed does well, we just save the seed for the mm. next season. And when you do that, actually, and the seed does well in this particular area, you find the seed just keeps producing more and more. Mm. I'll give an example of um, the maize we have. Mm. It's all organic seed. And this maize, actually, my grandma planted it for many years mm. until she passed away in the late 90s. Okay. And that's a seed that my parents have been using and now they have passed on to me also to keep growing that seed. Yeah. And that's a seed that has been feeding us for, I don't know, tens of years. Yeah. I cannot count. <laughs> Since I was a little child, <laughs> yeah. you know. And since my grandma was young, mm. you know, so something like that makes it more sustainable. Yeah. And then also we share with our friends, mm. with the local farmers. And you'll find, to be honest, some of these seeds that has been able to withstand mm. the weather patterns over the years is quite resistant. Mm. Like my maize was quite resistant to the amyom infestation Whoa. that happened last year. Yes. <laughs> and Because um, it has seen all the seasons, the dry, the yeah. wet. So I don't know if it's the DNA in the seed has come up with a good stream on its so. own because it's just uh, out in the natural yeah, environment. Yeah, it was actually a huge brand. Uh, government had a lot of um, yeah. billions trying to control it. Exactly. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, you actually mentioned that it can, uh, actually yes. was able to resist it. It was able to resist. It got a little but not much. Uh -huh. And the little that it got, I was actually able to get rid of the amyom with pilipili, with chili. Uh -huh. Yeah, we just crushed chili and mixed with the morobaini neem yeah the neem oil we literally poured it in the maize stalks mm. and we got rid of the army one yeah so the point i'm getting here is that the seed you use is actually very important yes in, uh, in terms of what you'll be able to have or harvest at the end of the season exactly wow yeah um and then now we move ahead huh? um now you know you are contributing this to you, yourself and your family mm. and you know the people around you. But now when you look at the bigger picture, what what does what does it look like? What's what's, what's your vision? Okay. Yeah. So my vision is not just for Ndeya, but of course I have to start here mm. because this is my home. Yeah. 
but my vision is actually for Kenya, East Africa and Africa as a whole. Because yeah. you know, I've been a woman farmer mm. all these years and many times people looked at me and they said you will never do it. You will never make it. It won't work. Mm. Small scale farming will not work. You'll never be successful. I've been told that to my face severally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> it happens to many women. They, they see you eye to eye now? Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, they can see me, and uh, now they actually are quiet. <laughs> They're like, let's wait and see how long this will take, you know, before yeah. you give up. Yeah. But you know, for me, I can actually say I've been privileged mm. because, by God's grace, I had an education. Mm. I'm able to read, yeah, and I'm able to search for the information. Yeah. But my heart goes out to, you know, my local woman counterpart here in the village. Mm. You know, she has a small piece of land. Her children are sickly, she's, they are hungry, mm. they don't have enough nutrients. That's my vision. Yeah. To be able to lift her up out of the dust and show her, you can actually feed yourself fast. Mm. You can actually give your children the very best. You can actually get a small surplus that you can sell. You know, so that's my vision for Africa. Because you know, what has happened, I think, over time in the field of agriculture mm. is that the people who are doing monocropping and who are doing large scale, have been elevated so much mm. and now the and, and yet to be honest the majority of farmers in africa are small scale yeah yeah and even kenya kenya mm. yeah the people who are feeding uh, most of kenyans yeah. are small scale farmers mm. it's not the huge farmers it's actually the small scale farmers yeah so they're the okay. ones who have the power what they don't have is the knowledge and they don't know they actually have the power mm. what they don't have is the knowledge they don't have the exposure so I would actually, you know, look for partners or the government or whoever is interested. Let us focus on these small scale farmers, especially the women who are the ones on the farm every day tilling and tilling. Yeah. And you know, like we've had our neighbors here and I keep encouraging them. Like I had a neighbor here, mm. you know, she was planting maize on an eighth of an acre. And this particular maize is one that takes five to six months mm. to mature. Yeah. Then the fails rain in between. The maize don't form the cob. Mm. She has nothing. She just cuts it down to feed her two cows for a month and she got nothing when you think about the effort the money of the seed yeah. the fertilizer she put in she didn't get it out mm. you know but what i'm trying to say how can we make it you know that anyone with an eighth is able to be self-sustaining you know not just in day and the dry areas and teaching them right you know grow the right thing for your area yeah please do not try to grow something that will not grow here mm. grow what is local to you grow what is indigenous plant the trees take care of your soil you yeah. know, that's my passion. How do I get out this information mm. to as many African farmers as possible? Yeah. And I'm grateful you're here because you're helping me get the message out, <laughs> yeah, to be true. honest. You know, yeah. many African farmers are watching this. Yeah. And I'm telling them it's possible. And feed yourself first. Yeah. And I just, you know, I want to be able to, you know, talk to as many farmers in Africa as possible oh. and share with them my story and share mm. them and tell them it can be done. We can feed ourselves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. It yeah. can actually be done. Yeah. So the good thing about it is that you've gone through it. Uh, people have actually sort of ridiculed you in terms of what you're doing. Yeah. But you you've come out on top. Yeah. Um. So in terms of organic itself, when we look forward, you know, five, ten years, as a country or as Africa, where do you see it? Um. Where do you see organic in the next five, ten years? Um, it's going to grow. Yeah. It's the next frontier, mm. to be honest. And mm. it's the only choice we have. Yeah. Because of our uh, climate change, you know, we don't know when the rains are coming. When they come, they come too much. Mm. You know, we have to make sure our soils are good to accept the rain that is there. So I just find that um, it's the next frontier. Mm. It's the only choice we have right now for the next generation. And I believe... Uh, when you talk to farmers, which yeah. we have done, we've done research and we've talked to different farmers mm. and many of them say that we actually want to go back to how we used to do the farming. Yeah. That was more sustainable. But they keep asking why, I mean how, sorry, how do we do it, mm. you know? The information is not there. But then what's happening in Kenya um, is that, the, um, you know, like we have an organic policy yeah. that I think has already got to the Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah. I'm not too sure how far it's gone, <laughs> but really hope that, you know, it's going to be passed as a policy mm. and it's going to be recognized by the government. Yeah. Because, you know, when once it's recognized by the government, then that information will trickle down yeah. much better through the extension officers mm. and the different departments of agriculture will be able to be aware 
and hopefully they'll be able to stick it up and be able to educate the farmers. Yeah. So, you know, we are moving in the right direction. I think it's going to grow big. I think the farmers will realize mm. that it's the best way to farm. So I have a lot of hope. Okay. Yes. Nice. So basically one of the concepts I have noticed um, throughout your philosophy and how you do things, it's about the idea of sustainability. The idea that we leave a better future for our kids and uh, our grandkids. Um, and you know we couldn't afford not to notice it. Your kids are very much integral in um, what you do. Yeah. Why? Why is it? What do you think is that uh, important to you and basically to future generations? Okay. Yeah. I think what you're saying is very true. So I found that uh, many times, uh, many farmers are actually very young, are, mm. are very old. Sorry. When we normally have the local farmers meeting, mm. you can actually count with your finger the number of farmers that are below 30 years old <laughs> and that is not a very good story yeah true to, because what is going to happen to us in the next 10 years mm. is that you're going to have masses who need to eat mm. and has very few people with the knowledge on how to farm yeah and what we're doing also mm. um, is that we are mentoring the local schools here yeah, yeah. so we have two schools we have a primary school mm. and we have a secondary school so we normally have uh, demo farms there, yeah. and we actually teach them how to do their small gardens, how to do farming, yeah. and how to be able to grow seafood for themselves and for their families. Mm. And uh, to be honest, you know, it's going to take some time, yeah. because the feedback is not very positive. Because they from have, their schools? Yes, from the students. Mm. Because what we found is that, um, you know, the schools are happy to have us there, Yes. but then now the students themselves are not very sure about this concept, mm. even as farming as a whole. Forget organic. Yeah. Because they have watched their parents go through farming, oh, struggling, yeah. Yeah. and not making anything out of it. Mm. And now for us to come and still tell them, you know, you have to go through the same journey mm. as your parents did and they're like, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I want to get out of the village as soon as possible, go to the city, get a good job and never come back here. Yeah, true. And that's what has happened with most of them. Mm. In fact, for us in our family, I mean, we're the only... Like I'm the only one who has actually gone back to the farm. Because, yeah. yeah, you know, most of us are still out in the city. Mm. So there's a big gap yeah. and it has to be bridged. And how do we do it? You know, even on the farm, we're working with young people. Mm. Yeah, we have young faces on the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes our life, you know, very good. <laughs> when young people come, in fact, we normally also mentor students from the university. Mm. You know, they normally come here once a year and they work on the farm and they see oh. what we're doing. Mm. And when they see we're young, they actually see it can be done. Mm. would love to join the people, you know? Yeah. And, you know, uh, like even the fact that we are women, in a way, is also encouraging. Yeah, exactly. You know, that we can also be able to do it. Mm. So, uh, in playing my part, apart from mentoring uh, kids in primary, in secondary, and uh, the university level, mm. I'm also mentoring my own children. Yeah. So they just Which is know. Very very important. Yes. Yeah. So they just know in their minds that they have to come to the farm. Yeah. So when they are on mid term, when they are on mid term, uh, um, they are always very active in the farm. Exactly. Yeah. They, are, they know that they are going to spend all their mid term, mm -hmm. all their holidays on the farm, and that helps them to be able to learn more about agriculture. Yeah. So at their age, they are able to identify more things. Yeah. than I was ever able to do. Yeah. They're able to appreciate how long it takes. Like I remember once we did a little garden with them mm. and they planted carrots and they got almost tired waiting oh. for when the carrot mm. is much will mature. Okay. And once it matures, when it goes on their plates, I find that they really appreciate it. Mm. They don't throw away food. Because nice. they knew it took me weeks mm. of watering this carrot. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to say I don't like carrots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they just eat it. So yeah. I just find, you know, and with time, I can't say they're perfect children. Of they're not angelic. Sometimes yeah. they don't like their vegetables. Mm. But I find the more that we expose it to them, they actually are acquiring tastes. Yeah. You know, they love to chew on their cucumber, the beetroot, the carrots, you know, mm -hmm. they eat the local fruits here. Even sometimes if they're bitter, they're just eating the you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I just like that their taste buds have actually, you know, acclimatized mm. yes. to eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. Okay. Another reason I bring them here is so that they can hopefully, you know, learn and teach their friends. Yeah. And as they grow older, they can be able to keep the farm running. Yeah, true. Yeah. Very, very good concept. Um, talking of uh, walking the talk. Um, I think we have uh, some, you know, 
your kids around. I think they can share with us a thing or two, and um, as in on why they they come to the farm once you know in mid terms, and um, you can start by introducing yourself. Hello, my name is Makena Kuria. Okay, Makena. Hi, my name is Max Kuria. Max. Yes. Nice. Hi, my name is Njuru Wakuria. Njuru Wakuria. Nice. Uh, very nice names, local names. Uh, so, what do you like most about coming to the farm? Huh? What I like is when I get to do the money maker. Money maker? Yeah, and we get vegetables mm. to cook at home. Okay. So, you, you get very active while doing the money maker. That makes you, makes you happy. Yeah. Nice. And uh, vegetables, what, what, what vegetables do you like? I like spinach. Mm. Yeah. Spinach. Yeah. It tastes good, it looks good. What, what do you like about it? It tastes good. It tastes good? Yeah. Nice. Max? Yes. What vegetable do you like? I like broccoli. Broccoli? Yes. I can see you're holding tight to your mother's you know, cereal basket. Do you want to continue with it? Do you want yes. to take it to the next level? Yes. Ah. So what 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 do you like most about broccoli? Um it tastes very good mm. and it's healthy for you. It's healthy for you. Yes. So you like the taste? Yes. Nice. Which vegetable do you like? I like cauliflower. Cauliflower. Yeah, so you like the colour, you like the taste? I like the colour, the mm. taste and how it looks. Now it looks. Nice. So when you come to the farm, what, what do you like to do on the farm? I like planting. Planting? Yeah. Planting uh, anything, any siblings, so you help your mom when she's planting? Yeah. So Max, what do you like most about being on the farm? Feeding chicken mm. and watering the plants. Watering the plants? Yes. What about feeding the chicken? Do you like the sound or the way they eat? I like how when we put the food mm. then we go mm. then we come back we see the clean the floor is very clean the floor is very clean yes nice when, when they are finished eating uh, mm -hmm. so then you see they're happy they're active yes okay so is it because you don't want to clean or you, you you just like it the floor being clean all the time i like the floor being clean uh. all the time Nice. Okay. So, do you like like engaging yourselves and um, do you tell your you know your other guys what you do on the farm when you off it? Sometimes, because my neighbor at home normally wants to come to the farm and he's never got a chance. Mm, nice. So you sometimes bring them here. He's never come. He he wants to come. He wants to come. So I guess. You'll bring him uh, next time. Yeah. Sawa, sawa. Thank you. Santi, so next time we come see, we'll see you taking over the farm and uh, helping people through the farm. See ya. Yes. Nice. guys what a conversation that was i hope you really really enjoyed uh, that conversation as much as i did as you can see she was very very knowledgeable all the way from the production side of organic on to the way of consumer side of organic so as you can see she's very very knowledgeable and she has uh, a lot of entrepreneurial tendencies so this is a conversation for all rounded individuals and um, I hope that uh, all the value that was there you can be able to extract it and really be able to use it um, on uh, this particular organic journey that we are in together so remember the end goal of this podcast is to be able to inspire you to be able to implement all this uh, particular findings on all this conversation and all these bombshells that will be revealed uh, in the subsequent episodes that we can be able to implement them in our own lives 
so that we can ultimately be able to have and live an organic life so if this particular podcast was of great um, knowledge to you remember to subscribe and also uh, to share it with someone who you may think will be interested in this particular kind of content because there's a lot a lot more conversations to come so we can also get social on social media especially on twitter at the organic guy and on instagram at the organic guy so that we can keep this conversation going so till next time ladies and gentlemen remember to be organic cheers